Well, I want to welcome everybody. My name is Valerie Pugsley. I am the area director of the Orange County Christian Business Partners um, in Southern California, and I am talking with Don Kemmer. He is one of the founding members of the Newcastle Christian Business Partners in Pennsylvania, but he is also the director of Cray Youth and Family Services. And so we're going to just do a little short interview to share more about that with you and see if there's a way that you can help and partner with them so they can help more people. So before we find out about how Don got involved with Cray and why he's so passionate about it, I wanted to ask you, Don, is there a story of somebody who stands out to you who has been helped by your organization? Uh, well I'll tell you, quite honestly, Valerie, it's difficult for me to say one. And the reason I say that, for being involved with the agency for 30 years, um, we have a saying here, once a Cray student, once a Cray kid, always a Cray kid. And so I still have kids that we are helping that are in their mid and late 30s. We're providing Christmas for their families, their own children. So we're getting generations. I feel like a grandfather to these kids and their, their kids coming along. But we have done everything from paying young people's rent to we have a car match thing. If they come up with $2,000, we'll provide $2,000 and they can go and buy a car. We help them in so many ways. And uh, right now it's just um, clear to me because we're, we're facing the um, Christmas season. So we actually are buying for 285 children this year. And we spend a minimum of $50 per kid. So you add that up. We're, and it's going to be a little bit higher than that because um, the kids will probably be over 300 by the time we finish our list. But those are kids that are present kids, former kids. And if you just roughly say $50 a person, we're spending about uh, $15,000 or more. We aren't, but we have donors in the community that do. And we've had an outpouring that is just nothing short of God's work. I'll give you an example. One week ago, we had a, the lady that I hired to do part-time fundraising for me. She said, I have 155 kids. I think with COVID and everything, people just have dropped off and are afraid. And then within one week, we had those covered and we had money pouring in to buy for another 150 kids. I mean, it's just like, you know, when you say the, take the one fish and a loaf of bread and look yep. what you do, you feed thousands. I mean, honestly, it's just, it's nothing other than that. We have 20 different programs, so we work with a lot of different kids at any given time, and there's a lot of success stories. There's certainly some tragedies from time to time, but far more success stories. You know, we have kids that go on to college. I have a young man that went to, was in my school program when I was there. He went to be a Marine, and he broke both of his legs during the, you know, that's very rigorous. He broke both of his legs during the time he was in the uh, basic training, he took an extra three months, healed, finished that, and did three tours in Iraq, and has come back and talked to our kids about it. I, I wish I would have wrote things down because there are so many interesting stories and things that have happened. So much. You could to probably my life. be here for an for hours then with all of right. the stories of people you've helped. But you know, you mentioned that you know once a cray kid, always a cray kid. And when we were talking beforehand, you said. The organization has been around for 36 years, but you've been with right. it for 30 years, starting right. out just as a volunteer, and now you're the director. Back 30 years ago, and uh, you talked about working with the at-risk population. What is it? Why is this population and this work so important for you? What, why did you get involved in the beginning? I think I was even intrigued as a teenager. I always wanted to help my peers, and I originally went to school. I said I wanted to be a pediatrician. I wanted to help kids. So then I started out in pre-med, and then I found out just the rigors that I was facing, and I just really wasn't prepared for that. So halfway through my sophomore year, I switched to psychology and sociology, and then I've been in that field ever since, and um, was able to be very successful. And, um, and it's a calling, just like you have a calling to ministry. Mine is youth ministry, and you know, and I, I try to bring hope to the hopeless. You know, you've heard that before, because so many of our kids are hopeless. And part of that is that they have no belief or understanding of God. And they've ever had it, anything in their life, no fault of their own. I had a girl last year, I was taking her home. We went past a church sign. It was, a, it was at Easter time. And it says, Christ is risen. And she looked at me seriously. And she, and this girl was 17 years old at the time. And she said, 
Mr. Kemmerer, I, what, what does that mean? I don't understand. Christ is risen. What is that? So I did my best 15 minute rendition of that so that you have some understanding. But since then, this same girl has lost her mother to drugs. And her mother, I had worked with her mother. Her mother was a teenager in my group home at Cray when I first started. And I was her counselor at the group home, teen. And then I worked with two of her daughters. Um, and they graduated from the school programming that I run. About a year after the graduation, their mother passed away. She was only 39 years old. And she had um, had a drug overdose. And, and I volunteered to um, do a eulogy because I had known this girl as a teenager. And rather than her just be like another statistic that there's another drug addict that's a, she was a great mother when she was not using, she was a great mom, but the addiction just would keep getting hold of her. And uh, she died of a heroin overdose. But, you know, I considered it my pleasure to be able to speak to that at the eulogy. And, and I've been able to do that with the strength of God, no other way. I, I don't even know how I say what I say. I just, God gives me the words, but I knew that we needed to have a positive perspective of what this girl's life is. This girl was not another statistic, but she was a mom and she was a good mom and that she was a good lady who just had really, the cards were stacked against her from the time she was a teenager and never got much better. Statistically, what would you say in, in situations like that where, you know, here she was, she was trying to do better and kind of bouncing back and forth do you have any statistics on that? Like how many can actually kick it and move forward or how many are get stuck there with the back and forth? I would say, to be quite honest with you, not, not necessarily drugs, but just going down the wrong way, like with the, in abusive relationships and things like that and getting involved in other kinds of things. Um, I would say we're probably about a 50-50 if I have to look at it. I'm long-term, you know, short-term after they leave us. Then in the first couple of years, they do very well. And what you hope, though, is you plant seeds. So I've seen kids who go off the charts and get out there and doing all kinds of crazy things in their 20s. And then at 30, they come knocking at my door and say, Mr. Cameron, I remember what you told me when you had me in school. And I want to know a little bit more about God. I want to know a little bit more. Why are you so hopeful? Why do you have a smile on your face every day when you greet me when nobody else smiles when they see that face? You know? They just go like this, you know, they say, how come you don't cringe like other people whenever I walk in the room, like, oh, my God, he's here. She's here again. I go, oh, my God, you're here. That's awesome. Come on in. Let me help you. And I and I couldn't do that. I couldn't have the patience. I couldn't have any of it without God in my life. I mean, it's I'm a miracle with that. I mean, it, God's created me to be able to do that, to be a conduit for him. I mean, I'm so blessed. If I died tomorrow, I was so blessed because of the opportunities I've had to touch so many young people's lives. I'm going to say, I don't know, 5,000 kids I've worked with over the years. Sounds like God's given you the ability to see the person behind the addiction, right? You, exactly. you don't see the addiction. You see, you see that, that little kid or that, that person, you know, who was innocent when they came in and because of life has happened or brain stuff that's going on with them or whatever, Right. You know, they self-medicate and, you know, that whole cycle that follows. So 2020, when we're recording this, has been a challenging year all the way around. And it sounds like God has really blessed you in terms of uh, the organization, in terms of this Christmas. But how, is, um, how has 2020 been a challenge for you? And how can anybody watching this video or other CBP members, how can we help? Cray, help more people? Well, you know, one of the things that we did, because there was a period of time where we were completely stay-at-home order. Now, stay-at-home order doesn't mean anything to myself and my staff because we are considered essential workers, and we weren't allowed to meet with the kids that were, we were servicing as far as them coming into program. So we developed a um, food security program, and we bought... 10 tons of food from the Pittsburgh Food Bank and over the period of several months there and delivered that to families. We would deliver it in, you know, week periods. Like if you have four children, we deliver that for a family of five a week's worth of groceries and we'd sit it on their porches. And that's the kind of thing we did. We made sure that none of our families 
And even if they weren't our families, if CYS had a family that we weren't working with and said, hey, Dawn, we need, you know, I need this family of eight taken care of. And we would have food out there the next day for them. We were blessed to be able to do that. And um, I think that um, we figured that we, I mean, COVID has been very costly. We've, keeping a running total, we've spent about $50,000 as an agency to keep our clients and ourselves, um, you know, because for everything from sanitizer to disinfectant, several thousand masks we bought. The thermometers, you know, everything you can imagine. New furniture, because if you have cloth furniture in our visitation house, which you have this program that is the idea is to reunify families. So you have people with drug addiction and they want their kids back. They can come to this safe place in like a nice living space and visit for an hour or two with their children in hopes of reintegrating the family. But we had to replace all the furniture with pleather. So there would be stuff we could wipe down. And notice I did say pleather because we couldn't afford leather. So it's <laughs> pleather, but it works. It keeps it clean and we can take off the contact. But, you know, just to do that, the extra manpower, those kinds of things. And we're not complaining, but that has been a cost. I mean, I rely more and more on my faith at this point because, you know, we're eight and nine months into this and my employees are tired. You know, I made sure I never missed a day. I could work at home. I could sit by my computer like this. I could Zoom everything I wanted to do. If I'm really going to be the leader, I need to show them that I'll I'll make the boxes. I'll do the things that need to be done too, that I will be around. And all of our programs are live right now. So they go virtual. Well, actually, our school just went virtual about a week ago because all the other schools in our county did. I make sure that I'm around to see everybody so that they know that their safety is important to me and that the kids know that that I'm still around, even as the executive director, although I might not be working hands-on with them as much. Well, I just came back from a program we run called Project Search. There are programs out there that are just for kids 18 to 21 who are autistic and ID. And they're usually in hospitals. We have ours at UPMC Hospital, and they get to learn, they get to do internships there. So they cooked the Thanksgiving dinner, and because of COVID, nobody could come, but I went up there and had dinner with them. In fact, if you can see this, this is our newsletter for this month. And this picture right here, right here are the kids actually today. And they had fixed all the food and we were eating. That's all the uh, interns up there. But that's a blessing too, to be able to do a program for autistic and ID kids. And then we helped them find jobs too. We went from the average for an autistic uh, young man or girl that comes out of regular high school of getting a regular job, not a shelter workshop, a regular job is between seven and 8%. We place over 80% in Project Search. This is our fourth year. So I'm very proud of that program as well as what else we do. So what are your current needs right now? Either maybe prayer requests or physical needs or people needs? Well, you know, I mean, I said we've, we've been really blessed. Like every year I keep saying like, this isn't going to happen every year. So we got to really we got a plan. And then every year it becomes twofold, tenfold. It's, I sit here and, and don't want for anything for the program. I mean, now if, if people wanted to do something, something that can always be used are sweatpants and hoodies of any size of, uh, you know, for adolescents. And then also hygiene products, anything from deodorant to whatever personal hygiene, shampoo, conditioner, soaps, those kinds of things are things that our kids oftentimes don't have. And I would like to have like a, uh, actually a hygiene pantry that would just have that stuff and have a, have a closet that just had uh, new sweatpants and sweatshirts for whenever kids come to school and they don't even have something to wear, that we have something for them to put on and they could and not just put on, but they could keep it. Okay, great. And then you said you've got like 20 different programs. So right. um, we'll put a link down below of that. The links for the the one-to-one um, -one mentoring um, videos and the Compeer video that, that is out. Um, as far as our website, uh, it's crayyouth.org will give you the ability to get on and look at everything that we do. And it'll even right. give you the link towards the Confluence, which is our coffee shop too. So if you're in the area, you can go to the Confluence and see what they're doing there or the donations that we just talked about. And we'll put links below. Uh, any specific prayer requests that you would like us to be praying for, for you or the organization? I think just praying for uh, the youth we serve right now. Um, our youth are vulnerable as it is. You know, the odds are stacked against them. And then you put COVID in there on top of everything else. Um, you know, it really has broken up families. Um, I have a young lady that 
her name's Michelle, that I would want a special prayer request. She's a young lady I've worked with since she was 14. She resurfaced about a month ago and had been in rehab. She's had drug problems her whole life. She's 36 now, and um, she still struggles. And she was doing very well. I had helped her get into a, a three-quarter house. I had her reporting in to see me twice a week, took her to breakfast, was doing things for her, got her some clothes, and, and now she has gone out and is uh, back to using again. I don't know where she's at exactly, but I'm very concerned. And, and, and the thing is, I know this girl wants God because she and I had some discussions about that, and she was going to go to uh, Victory Family Church, which is a non-denominational church here, and I knew she would like it because they really welcome young people. I didn't quite get her there. I was ready to, I think she was ready to go, but she is looking for God. She knows that she needs that, you know, so she's using drugs to fill voids. It's unfortunate, but just a special prayer for her, but prayers generally to the youth that we serve and their families that the holiday season can be something positive for them. And I don't mean gift wise. I don't mean, you know, it's not about that. Right. It really isn't. It's just about keeping them safe. Domestic violence is prevalent because they don't have what they need need you know you, you they start arguing over the finances and things of that nature and you know for many people that grew up in a normal family christmas is and thanksgiving are, are joyous holidays but for these kids it's some of the worst times in their life because they've seen too many negative things that's when mom or dad relapsed and that's when dad went to prison and all that kind of stuff and this year particularly with covid i i, I just can't even imagine being inside their minds how it must be tough so i just pray that, that god watches over them is that something that you're seeing more of? And this is something that, you know, I've speculated on and don't know, but that a lot of kids are having to be schooled at home. And in the past, that was their refuge was to be able to get out of the house to go to school. And now they're stuck there. <clears throat> or like you just said, there's just this added stress. So if parents were already having issues, it's just making it worse. Uh, absolutely. And we are a refuge. Kids will come to school. Our kids will come to school sick any time of the year. We try to Tell them now you can't, but we started school in August on time in person because we knew how bad our kids needed it. And we were one of the only schools that did. And we stayed out until the last county school said we have to go virtual, which was just about a week, two weeks ago. We had done uh, 50 some days of school before we had to go virtual. And, and if we can get back, we're going to go back because we know how hard it is. But we are um, using the technology, our counselors. And teachers are all using either Google Meets, Zoom meetings. The counselors are meeting one-on-one -on -one with the kids. The teachers are meeting one-on-one -on -one with the kids, um, doing whatever it takes. Uh, we're sending aides out to the houses with food. With uh, If they don't have computers, we send them out with papers to do instead of if they can't don't have a computer at their disposal. You know, we're just trying to be a part of their life, you know, because holidays were always the worst for them because they come, they come running back to us like, hugginess and like oh i'm so glad to be back in school and now they can't have that so that sounds like a good prayer request too in addition to michelle for all of the families who are children living with at-risk parents and are at risk that this is definitely a, a challenging time for them normally so even more so with covid yes. 21 2020. Well, yes. Don, thank you so much for sharing thank you so much for being faithful to the calling and using that gifting that God has given you to be able to see the people behind the addiction, right? That, that there's a real person there and they have real needs. Thank God for you and what you're doing and for Cray Youth and Family. And anybody watching this, if you want to help out and have the uh, further the success that they're having, then feel free to check the links below and, and donate and be praying for all of those people who are affected, whether from Cray family or just all around the world right now. Um, just as just a, a little personal note here, Valerie, I'm very proud. I have just one child, my son, and he's a special education teacher in South Carolina near Lexington. And he's had to go through COVID too. Uh, he had COVID as a result of being back in the school. So he's in the trenches every day, but he, he's doing what he wanted to do, but also what God wanted him to do. And I couldn't be more proud as a parent. You know, he's never gonna get rich doing that, but his, to hear his stories of what he gets to do and how he helps the kids is just a joy to me as well. I thank God for that every day that he was able to have that impact on others and find that 
as joyous in his heart as I do what I do. That's awesome that you were able to be such a good example for him and something for all of us, right? To go out there and be a good example, bring, be a light in the community around us, wherever it is, whether we're supporting Cray or some other group and just taking the time to see the people, right? Behind the stories, see the people behind the mask and everybody has a story in a situation where they can use some help and some prayer. So thank you, Don, so much for thank doing you this. For, for taking the and, time as well. Uh, Hope we'll find some more people to uh, help you out. I appreciate that. It's just nice to be able to share this. So if I'm sharing it with other people and it's an inspiration to anybody, then that's great. And if people get inspired so much to look in their own communities for opportunities to mentor, to be a volunteer with disadvantaged youth, um, that can be a great calling too. And it can be something you can do with just a couple hours a week. The young man I'm working with, Waited two and a half years to have somebody to work with him because people were afraid of his autism. And now I've been working with him for a year. And you'll see in the video, he'll talk about days turned to months, turned to years as he waited. But um, it, it had to be the right time for me and for him. So, But anyway, if, you know, people can find a way to volunteer in their home communities. That's just as good as if you were to help Cray ourselves. I would be thrilled with whatever people can do. And it's difficult right now because how do you volunteer with COVID, but, you know, maybe post COVID in the hopefully not too distant future. Right. Right. Uh, that's wonderful, Don. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you. Um, Same here.